Uh, welcome everyone to this week's IPLD Sync meeting. It's uh, April 1st, 2019. And uh, first of all, we need a note taker. Any volunteers? Thanks, Rod. Um, and anyone else, please put your name on the crypt pad on the attendees list. And then we can get started. Um, so, um, yeah, there's not that much on the agenda, but let's start with the um, two week update. Um, my update is pretty short. It's in the meeting minutes. Um, there's plenty of uh, links, but what I basically did is finally the new JS IP, uh, AP, JS IPLD API is merged and released. And then afterwards, we had a lot of um, discussions about um, the JavaScript API that's still ongoing. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's basically the the generation after the current one. And uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, just follow the uh, links over there. And for the next two weeks, I will probably work on the formats um, IPLD format stuff again to basically do the implementation, the actual implementation for the current draft we have so that um, the consumers like um, Unix FS can finally use the async await API. Um, Alex was basically asking for it when it is finally done, and hopefully, yeah, we'll have this soon. Um, that's all I have. Um, next on the list is Michael. Hey, um, so I have a couple items that are like uh, things to update on and then a few things that we'll have a discussion about. So I'll, I'll push some of the discussion off until later, but just mention it real quick. Um, one is that, so the big thing is like Unix v 2 draft has been updated to the latest spec. Um, it doesn't, you, it's still Seabor only and kind of assumes Seabor um, until the, the next rev of the IPLD interfaces finishes, it's going to be a little bit too hard to update it to just be really agnostic. But right now it does work. It is like path agnostic and all that stuff. And it has uh, almost complete code coverage now. It's just a few more lines to really do. Um, so the docs are up for the summit in Berlin. Um, I, I sent them out in the Slack uh, room. But uh, if you haven't gotten those, um, let me know. And I'll make sure that you are added to them or given a link or whatever you need. Um, but they, there's three of them. They detail sort of like the first two days and then the last two days of our time in Berlin. So the last two days, we're going to open up a bit more and sort of invite more people in. So that's why there's separate documents. We can invite people to those docs. Um, we'll have a discussion later about uh, DAG JSON and a few decisions that I think that we need to make because they impact this like inline block stuff. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and also talk about this identity multi-hash thing that I did not know existed, and I didn't know if anybody else knew existed, uh, but we need to be considering that, <laughs> since that apparently is a thing that I had no idea about. Um, and uh, that's it, Eric. I'm using identity multi-hashes in my uh, test cases because they're really helpful. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, yeah, I, I think like they are really useful once I realized that they existed. Um, the issue is that like all of our traversers sort of assume that a CID is a reference to something that you pull out of the block store, not that like the CID would just have the data in it <laughs> as part of the multi hash. Uh, so I think like we, we may need to be considering that. <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought about that. Um, <laughs> I hope that fits within, yeah. Um, so in the last week or so, I've worked a lot on the, the traversal packages in the Go IPLD Prime stuff. And some of that is now a Go. The traversal.focus, if you will, a function which takes a node and a path and gives you some callback which acts on a new node. Um, this function is now implemented completely and works and is agnostic to any links in the middle of that path. So that's really cool. Um, that allows us to do some stuff that I think is 
kind of never been supported before. Um, it doesn't let you mutate things in the middle of the path that would require a little more glue code that has to be happening right now. Um, but it lets you like jump into a thing and do something, which is a view only sort of operation. Um, and that's really cool. And that has test cases now. And that has sort of proven out a whole bunch of other code in IPLD Prime, which has basically not been tested before. So more finely grained tests for a bunch of this stuff would be very welcome. But some very high level integration tests are now like working. So that's cool. Um, what's the so significance of the, of, sorry, what's the significance of the word focus in this stuff? Uh, it's a word I made up. It means that we are, so given some node and given some path, where a path is like a series of path segments, each of them being one specific jump that you might make. So like you've got a map and you've got a key and you're indexing into it, that's one path segment. You've got a list and you've got one integer and you're indexing into it, and that's a path segment and so on. Uh, given one node and one path of hops like that, you can get to another node. So you can give me a node and a path and a callback, and I will call the callback with that node. So it sort of lets you do that sort of read-only inspection on some graph in a very generic way. Um, so what we want to do next is then take that sort of very specific implementation and now do it for very generic things like so, so traversal.focus is like the equivalent of doing tab complete and bash a whole bunch and then getting to the end of something and then pressing enter. And we want to have now maybe some selector implementations where we have the equivalent of like dot slash star in bash and then something happens or dot slash star star and like that's a fair bit trickier, but it would be nice if we did that. Um, so now I'm so now I'm at home trying to make traversal dot traverse or something like that do the right thing. Um, and so it's really nice to have the the focus implementation there, so it shows what the depth of complexity is that we will get to when jumping to one specific node in the tree. Um, and now I'm trying to make that stuff work for selectors in general for like a whole n subsection of the tree is, is really interesting. Um, I've started trying to work on that this week, and it's, I should maybe constrain myself to saying it's really interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so for example, I've started to look at the, the bash code that does the nearest equivalent to some of the most general things that we've wanted to ask from this subsystem. And uh, I'm not sure if, if anyone else in the room is familiar. So in, so in Bash, you can do like dot slash star, and it'll match uh, one thing where the star is. And then a feature which often converts people to ZSH, for example, but also exists in Bash, is called glob star. And it lets you do dot slash star star, and then match. And that will work recursively. Um, and that's kind of an interesting feature because if you use it by itself, it's fairly obvious what it does. And if you use it with other globs or other pattern matches in the same command, it becomes really interesting. Um, so I started working on, on traversals and selectors this week that tried to do that sort of thing. And, uh, uh, I got into turning carpet territory. I don't know. I'll, I'll try to write a better report of this later. <laughs> Basically, there's a whole bunch of things where if you want to transmit the Merkle proof for this thing, then you're going to want to do a pre order traversal. And if you want to do blob star or star star traversals, then good luck reconciling that. That's about what I figured out this week. Cool. Um, then uh, the update from Rod. Yeah, so I've been working on um, this map implementation stuff. It's really, it's a really good um, 
uh, I guess it's a really good intro to data structures in IPLD, is it? And it, it seems to me that the jump to different kinds of collections isn't that great once we have basic collections in place. So um, I've done a I've done a hamped implementation in JavaScript. Uh, it's of, of a champ variety, which there's a couple floating around of that variously implement that. Um, it's it's a little bit like the one that's that's in, in Go at the moment. It's Go hamped. IPLD, I think it's called. Um, but that, I mean, that doesn't stick to any particular spec um, and it's a little bit loose in some areas. So it's it's sort of similar to that, but not quite. Um, it's it's a bit more close to the one in in Ian's peer Goss thing. Um, anyway, it's so I, I've modeled it. So it feels like a JavaScript map, but it's asynchronous and immutable. So every every mutation or operation creates a new um, node that you then need to do something with. Um, so serialize or keep on mutating. Um, and it, it's working really well. I, I'm, I'm, I'm currently bogged down in getting tests covering weird edge cases in um, uh, the compaction. So that's you know making sure that the different forms of trees when you delete nodes that they compact up properly. Um, there's there's a bunch of different ways that they can be formed that are special cases. So um, and I'm trying to get test cases that form the trees in those ways and then compact them in in the right way just to show that it works. And and, and in doing that, I found some problems in the in in my algorithm. Um, so um, it's going well. It does raise a bunch of interesting questions, though, which I, I'm hoping to I'm hoping to get this up in the next couple of days so that um, I, we can ha start having these discussions because I think they're really interesting. So um, things like um, what's the final serialized form of this thing uh, of of these data structures, and I'm, I'm going to need some help from you guys who have been um, serializing stuff into Seaball more than I have. Um, you know, I I I just reach for a, just a naive sort of um, serialization, serialization, but it would be it'd probably take up more space than it needs to. Um, what's the optimal branching factor? The optimal bucket size? Um, when is inline versus linked entry storage best? Um, what about the hash algorithm? I'm currently I'm presuming pluggable hash algorithm with different length of um, of hash bytes. Um, and which side do you come from? There's a discussion in in Slack about um, which side of a hash you take from, left or right, uh, and that's actually a kind of a complex question because it depends on the hash you're using but also is the hash pluggable and do you know up front how many bytes it is and then when you serialize this thing can you um, pull it back out and have the right hash algorithm and the right number of bytes all this sort of stuff so um I, i've got the way i've got it is there's lots of documentation uh it, it even though it's the 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 structure is complex I've, I've, it's heavily documented and the tests tests should be should explain it a lot better so hope i'm hoping that um those kinds of discussions are practical when we've got something to look at that is not too difficult to grok. So that's hopefully in the next couple of days. Cool. Thanks for the update. Um, yeah. So this was, so does anyone else have an update um, before we move on to the deeper discussions? No. All right. So, um, yeah, so on the, I've put also Michael's stuff on the agenda list, under the agenda in this meeting. Um, kind of like, like what I want to talk about is this uh, nested IPLD formats or nested blocks or inline blocks or whatever, whatever we call them. But this basically overlaps what Michael wants to discuss. So I guess I just hand over to Michael and then, yeah, yeah we'll see. Well, uh, yeah, I think like we sort of have a solution now for the inline block stuff, right? In a in a really fucked up way, which is like just abuse the identity CIDs, <laughs> because like you you effectively do end up getting like like we we were looking for a way to just take the the format multi codec and then mash it up against the, the raw data, and that that's effectively what happens um, with an with an identity multi hash and CID. Um, yeah, which three perhaps explain for like like other people on the yeah, call yeah, that yeah. don't know. So, well, okay, okay. So, so like <laughs> I, I, I was reading the thread, I think it was like in 2015. Juan was like, you know what, sometimes the data that you're hashing is smaller than a hash. 
So why don't we just like add a multi-codec for instead of a hash, here's just the data, here's the bytes. Um, <laughs> and uh, use that as the identifier if it's gonna end up being shorter than a multi hash or uh, shorter than the actual hash uh, anyway. Now, um, great idea. It turns out that like, because there's no limit on the size of this, you could effectively use it at any point to create multi-hashes that just like <laughs> have a bunch of binary data with like a thing that says, hey, this is binary data in front of it. And then because CIDs are just like extra metadata on top, like in front of a multi-hash, you could do what is effectively an inline block by just saying, oh, here's the CID with an identity multi-hash and all of the binary. And there's no limit on the size. So um, the thing that, that like uh, Gonzalo has been asking for is effectively accomplished with this because like you can just keep embedding them and you can even nest them. Um, the issue is that like, I don't think that we've really considered this use case in the rest of the IPLD ecosystem. Like when you're doing traversals and you're doing resolutions, you return a CID if you're trying to traverse it through something. You don't try to then interpret it as a block. And if you hand a CID to a block store, they try to like look up that, that identifier as a block. They are, they're, they're no, at this point, I don't know of any that are like going, oh, no, 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 like the data's inside of the CID, I'll support out. Um, so there's like some work to do, I think, to support this. Um, but it sounds like that solves the issues that he's wanted. I mean, it doesn't solve parameterized blocks, but like however you design the parameterization um, metadata for like the self-describing nature of whatever that looks like, you would just put it on Cbor and then you would just embed it in one block, right? Um, yeah. yeah, so my question would be, the, I mean, it solves the problem, but is it the, the solution we want to go for, for having something like inline blocks? I mean, it's effectively the exact same Thing as we were talking about, right? Which is taking the codec and mashing it up against the binary block and then just embedding the binary data. Like, it's not really that much different. I think like the only thing that really changes is that, so we, there's this thread that I have it in, in DAG JSON about like, do we want to create a format that isn't actually valid JSON in order to make binary not suck and like be able to append binary to the end block and just have references to it? Or do we want to say like, no, it's better for this like to just be JSON and if you want to talk to binary, you have to link to it. Because if use cases like this are going to become prominent, then like you can't really do them in dead JSON effectively. Because you're just going to have like these tiny little, like a tiny little bit of metadata and then like a giant base 64 like uh, CID that, that's mostly binary data. Um, like, yeah, that doesn't really work. So that was my only thought there. Okay, so so my concern would be if you, if you keep nesting things, it becomes pretty ugly. <laughs> like <laughs> you keep nesting things. To a, so I was just wondering if you like if like a, just as an alternative idea, like not like pretty thought through, but do 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 you perhaps want to have something like you specify a CAD, which is like an inline CAD, and then you put the binary data somewhere else, so kind of like um, making the CAD and the data separate as it is with blocks. So with blocks also you have the CAD and you have the data, and with inline blocks you also have the CAD somewhere, and then you have the binary data somewhere else. Because like if you put that, into the same I thing, you have this big blob of, I mean, I mean, it would totally work. I'm just wondering if that's... No, no, but, but, then, but then the block data doesn't actually get encrypted in, with the same... Oh, that's stuff, true, right? yeah. That's yeah, true. yeah. Like, like that's the reason that you need to inline the data. Um, yeah, like you're, you, you, yeah, you'd effectively like it, it. Would be fine if you were only worried about the security of like the the graph indexing, but um, if you're worried about like the security of the entire block store and not storing anything in plain text if it's actually encrypted, then you would end up in st storing a bunch of plain text like blocks that people thought were getting encrypted. Yeah. If you weren't inlining. So I guess the like. This way is like, at least it's a way that works. And if it turns out it's a better day, we will find out. I mean, it, it, it's a good yeah. way to get started and see if it works. And then if it mm -hmm. doesn't, we will just do something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so, mean, uh, sorry, yeah, I'd like, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering why this is such an ideal solution as opposed to some other entity? Is it, is it simply because it fits within the current structure and so it's easy to shoehorn in? Or, or is this, 
It no, seem to no, I, I wouldn't say that. Like a special case, then then why not introduce a special case that is, you know? No, I mean, to my mind, like like the the ideal case was actually something very different, and where we ended up going in this direction is just the fact that like no, we we want to be able to have data from other formats get encrypted along with other block data. Like that's, that's the main point. So like, if, if I want to link into a Git block and then I want to go and encrypt the entire structure, I effectively get a bunch of blocks back that are all encrypted, um, right? And I don't lose any of that like linking nature of IPLD into the Git block. And like at first I kind of hated this and now it seems like kind of the most elegant thing in a weird way. Um, <laughs> Like, well, no, but, but to be clear, like, I think that, um, I think that this should just be in, at some point, it's just going to be encoded in some kind of binary. Effort. So, so, okay. The way that I'm imagining this is that, like, take the nesting nature out of it for a second. If you have a block that's encrypted, it'll have metadata that says, hey, I'm encrypted, and then it will have a property, like, called, like, data, that's the actual encrypted binary data. That could be a link to a separate raw block that is binary, or it could be inlined. Right, so that that's like still nice and everything. It's just that um, that gets decrypted <laughs> and then like interpreted as um, you know whatever you reference in the in the encryption data. Does that make sense? So like I don't think that we should use these inline C. Like if I said that an inline CID was DAG CBOR and then I gave you the whole binary but it was encrypted, you would have no way to decrypt it, right? Like like that that doesn't really work. So for the purposes of encryption, we're still going to have to have a field in there that says like, what is the format for the encryption? So that after I decrypt it, I know how to interpret it. But then if there's other data inside of that block that had to be inlined into the block in order to get encrypted, that's where we're using this like fancy CID. Um, or we're using this, this CID with an identity multi-hash in it, if that makes sense. What is the, maybe I'm, I'm also missing some of this. Like what, what's the, what's the use case? It's like, okay, I have like, I have a JPEG and I don't want to, I don't want to just send you the, I don't want to encrypt the JPEG and then put the encrypted hash in the, in the CID. I want to actually just inline the whole JPEG and send it to you. Well, so a, a JPEG is, is relatively easy because that's just still raw binary data. I think that the problem is that, like, um, say, say I have a data structure that I want to encrypt, like the whole thing, right? Um, then, and some of the links in that are to, like, Ethereum blocks and Git blocks. Um, I need to encrypt those as part of the data structure. So what's going to have to end up happening is, like, I'm going to have to inline that data somewhere in some other block that actually fully gets encrypted and can be interpreted as part of the encryption program. I think the, the main issue is that like all this metadata that we're talking about adding has to be added a layer above the thing that you're encrypting. And so if it's not in the IPLD data model, like it's in these other content address formats, it effectively has to be inlineable um, so that we can get it into something in the data model that we can then interpret. Isn't that what like multi-codecs are for? Yes. Yeah, the, the, so the reason for using a CID with an identity hash, um, like in order to inline it, is so that you get the multi codec from the CID. I mean, as opposed to like this new structure you're importing, right? Isn't that, I mean, maybe I don't understand what multi codecs are really supposed to be for, but I guess I thought that. You know, you have like whatever, like there's like a multi codec for like this is what a git commit looks like and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you were really doing, had one of these structures that you wanted to use, wouldn't you just call one of those a multi codec and that's how you would specify what the yeah. internal structure looked like? So you have data that's already in a multi codec, like it's a git commit, right? Um, and I need to like, I have some metadata about that that I want to encrypt. And I also want to encrypt the block so that I can send it to somebody, even if it's multiple blocks, I can send it to somebody and nobody knows what's in it, right? Um, so I need two things, right? I need um, a bunch of information about the encryption that I like, that I send and, and the data around it, that all needs to get encrypted. And then I need to have a reference to this block um, with, with that multicodec, with the git multicodec in front of it, um, so that we know how to interpret the block data. But if I make that a separate block, 
then it won't end up getting encrypted, right? Because then the hash wouldn't match. So what I have to do is I have to like take the, all of the data, including the multi codec, and then put it inside of another block that I'm actually encrypting. That is like, inter that you can actually interpret. Oh, so we're, we're talking about, it, right. So we're talking about packaging these within just, just a small shell that has the additional metadata. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I was picturing as these things go inside anything. So you, you could have, you know, a block with a lot of stuff in it, then you just have this hanging thing yeah. on the side. But no, it's just, I mean, it's just like, it's just a boxing mechanism. Yes, yes. Well, and I mean, like, the thing is that we are opening a door here to like, it, it, potentially like infinite nesting. <laughs> but like, there's, there's a bunch of other reasons why you don't want to have gigantic blocks. So that's probably okay. <laughs> um, like, if somebody ends up creating gigantic blocks, like they won't work in a bunch of places. So it's all right. Um, there's, there's enough incentive already to reduce block size. I'm yeah. looking forward to the IPLD bomb, which basically <laughs> infinitely. <laughs> but luckily, we're using a DAG, so it can't happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <you're laughs> <impressive. Four. laughs> no infinite recursion, at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, um, is, is there anything else? Because we already have like our half an hour is already full. I think Michael wanted to talk about the deck chase and stuff, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, we can put that off probably. Um, I think now that we're kind of running out of time, um, if anybody has anything about the summit that they want to bring up, um, that would be cool. Um, make sure you check out the docs. But yeah, like the summit in Berlin, we, we need to start ironing out details. Um, did anybody book any place to stay yet? Because I'm looking at potentially just getting like a big place for us all to crash in. Um, yeah. There are some, and like a few of them are nice enough that they have like um, a space for us to like work out of for the first few days too. So that would be nice. Cool. Yep. All right. Okay, great. Anything else? Last chance. All right. And then I close the meeting and see you all again in two weeks. Hopefully then with a live stream. <laughs> 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 Goodbye. <laughs>